Good afternoon. Hello and welcome. My name is Nines Ponce and I am the director here at the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. Before we begin, at UCLA, we acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the original land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. Thank you for joining us for today's online seminar, Hidden No More, Unmasking Data for Health Equity. To honor Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander tradition, we'd like to begin today's event with an opening blessing by Pastor P.K. Thompson from the Dominguez Samoan Congregational Christian Church in Compton, California. Pastor Thompson. Greetings and thank you, uh, Nanez, for that uh, introduction and for that acknowledgement of those who first harvested and were stewards of this land. Before I uh, give an official blessing, I wanted to read something um, from the late uh, Christian uh, mystic and uh, uh, once wrote that the awakening of the inner self is purely the work of love. And there can be no love where there is not another to love. Furthermore, one does not awaken his or her innermost eye merely by loving God alone, but by loving others in return. In the light of our theme for this um, very, very important talk, you know, in the Christian tradition, there's a notion of what is um, ubiquitous throughout the Christian Bible of revelation. Revelation means to unveil or reveal what has been hidden. And I think it's important for this talk as we navigate our way forward for the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community um, that many of the underlying health disparities and the data that we talk about is in more ways than one and an unveiling of an identity of people uh, who have been marginalized and subjugated for years, who have a history of colonialism. And with this, I am thankful to offer blessings on behalf of the Native Hawaiian and Pacific people, uh, and also specifically of the Samoan people. So I wish you all a great and very productive and conducive talk today. And let me offer some words of encouragement and a blessing uh, for all of us today. God, we come before you through many different lenses of faith and many different lenses of our cultural and professional experiences. But we ask in this moment that you, whomever we name you, that you grant us wisdom and that you grant us patience and may the data and the information that we share have faces and names and communities and people to whom we are accountable to. Let all that we share today and let all that will be unveiled and revealed be in the name of love as Thomas Merton reminds us. That in the work that we do, whether we are people of faith or not, we are always guided by love, whether that be under the title and the name of equity, sustenance, sustainability, equality, justice. It is all driven by love and to fully love God, as Merton reminds us, is to fully love each and every one of our neighbors in need. In the name of God, I pray. In the name of Jesus, I pray. In the name of all that is holy to whom who are participants uh, throughout this talk, I say amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Thompson. Now, it is both my pleasure and my privilege to introduce the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research's Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, NHPI, COVID-19 Data Policy Lab. 
So about five months ago, I started meeting with community leaders, advocates, and researchers about the disproportionate impact COVID-19 was having on this vibrant, close-knit Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities, um, so often hidden by a lack of disaggregated data. I began scraping data first alone, then joined by my colleague, Brittany Mori, a faculty member at UC Irvine, and finally, thanks to Dr. Reynold um, Samoa, who enlisted the help of three volunteers, volunteers, Calvin Chang, Karina Pinaya, Carla Thomas, who were motivated to help the communities from which they belong. Today, we have six scholars from across the United States. Joining Calvin, Karina, and Carla are Vanan Tran, John Greer, and Nicholas Pearson. So you'll hear from them today. Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are facing the highest COVID-19 case rates of any race and ethnicity here in California and throughout the country, including Arkansas, Washington, Hawaii, Illinois, Oregon. In the 20 states that report their case rates, NHPIs rank first in 70% of them. They also face higher rates of chronic disease, along with barriers such as having fewer financial resources, living in large multi-generational households, and living in densely populated neighborhoods that put them at significantly higher risk. Additionally, about 25% of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders work in essential roles. These roles are essential for everybody, uh, further exacerbating that risk for them. The NHPI COVID-19 Data Policy Lab will debut a dashboard that highlights the impact of COVID-19 has had on this community and aims to address data and research gaps and urge, urge more states to report disaggregated NHPI cases and deaths. And I'm humbled to say that the data produced by our team have been used in testimony before the US House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee, featured in news media, presented to local and national response teams. So that's really important in terms of getting action. And just this morning was featured in a health affairs blog, uh, totally by the students by Karina, Carla, and Calvin. Congratulations. So by the end of this important presentation, we hope that our audience can understand why there is a critical need for data, data that will ultimately lead to dedicating much needed resources for this highly impacted group. This work truly aligns with UCLA Center for Health Policy Research's mission to democratize data, to inform policy and improve health outcomes. If you're interested in today's slides or would like to get involved and support our lab, please email our communications team at the email address shown on your screen. And please stay tuned for announcements on upcoming um, seminars. There's a seminar on September 30th featuring the new data release for the Elder Economic Standard Index, a groundbreaking analysis and research of the economic challenges facing California seniors. Now, I'd like to introduce our brand new NHPI COVID-19 Data Policy Lab, beginning with Karina Panaya. Go ahead, Karina. Thank you, Dr. Ponce. Before we begin, we would like to thank our ancestors who came before us community elders, leaders, and youth voices who have paved the way for us to do this work. We are grateful that their advocacy brought attention to the need to have our own data category in the first place. We would like to thank the following co-sponsors, National Pacific Islander COVID-19 Response Team, Southern California Pacific Islander COVID-19 Response Team, Asian American and Pacific Islander Civic Engagement Fund, and the UCLA Asian American Study Center for supporting the NHPI COVID-19 Data Policy Lab. Next slide. We express our deepest gratitude to the faculty members and mentors, Dr. Nia Aito-Oto, Dr. Reynold Samoa, 
and Alisi Tuluwa, who have dedicated their time to support our work. Unfortunately, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. As indicated in these line graphs, we see that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders represented as the dark blue lines are experiencing the highest COVID-19 case rates in comparison to any other racial and ethnic group across the country. We see this devastation occurring from the West Coast to the East Coast, more so in regions with dense populations of this population, especially in states such as Arkansas, California, and Illinois. However, the case rate data for these trend lines is available only because of the states that are currently reporting disaggregated data. This is absolutely necessary to create a comprehensive understanding of NHPI health and without it, we are left behind trying to understand why COVID-19 and other health issues continue to afflict our community. At this point in time, only 30% of states are reporting NHPI disaggregated data represented in the orange. This is a huge challenge that has only heightened the need to advocate and strongly encourage more states to start disaggregating. When states combine Asian Americans and NHPIs together, this obscures issues that burden this community and paints an inaccurate portrait. By capturing the diversity of NHPIs and breaking the numbers down by key characteristics, it is much easier to address barriers to health access and also provide adequate resources that are vital to improve NHPI health. Now, I will hand it over to Vinan Chan to provide more information. Thank you, Karina. When API data is aggregated, we see that only 5% of API children live in high poverty areas. 22% of API children and teens are overweight and obese. 8% of API high school students do not graduate on time. However, NHPIs only make up 6% of the API population. This brings up a question. Do these aggregated API stats truly reflect what is going on with the NHPI community? Let's take a look at one example, the percentage of APIs that hold a bachelor's degree. Here, we see that 50% of APIs hold a bachelor's degree or higher. However, when this API data is disaggregated, we see a very different situation. Looking here at Pacific Islanders, we see that the percentage for Pacific Islanders to be significantly lower. It's less than 20% for Pacific Islanders, which is nowhere near the 50% with the aggregated API data. It becomes clear that aggregated data mask inequities within the NHPI communities. But this also holds true for other subgroups among Asians. We see that when we disaggregate data, Bhutanese have the lowest bachelor's degree attainment at 11%, while Taiwanese and Asian Indians have the greatest percentage at 75%. Next, I will hand it back to Kriya Panaya, who will talk about the NHPI group. It is imperative to acknowledge the diversity of NHPIs. The Pacific Ocean is home to well over 20,000 unique islands. Amongst a sea of islands filled with such a rich set of cultural knowledge and heritage, the one thing we share is our familial connectivity and tie to the community. We are very communal people, selfless with the intent to serve and put others first ourselves. Next slide. In the states, about 20 NHPI subgroups are counted by the census, which fall under three main groups, Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia, each with their own cultures, traditions, and languages. This is nowhere near an exhaustive list. Keeping all of this in mind, disaggregated data is a step in the right direction to inform stakeholders about the prevalent issues NHPIs experience. Looking at the data by specific groups is critical to ensure that NHPIs have a voice in policy decision-making and access to public and private resources necessary to address their needs in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner. And now, Carla Thomas will share how the data is used in the community. 
Thank you, Karina. As we've just seen, the NHPI umbrella is an extremely large and diverse racial group, and the unique cultures and histories of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, as well as the ever-growing diaspora here in the United States, make the group highly distinguishable from others, despite their frequent aggregation with other racial groups or otherwise complete omission from demographic data. NHPIs are historically and presently overlooked, even in a time where racial disparities in COVID-19 are a significant topic of national public health discussion. With a high stakes pandemic, there's an urgent need for widely available disaggregated NHPI data, which has been the founding reason for the inception of this data policy lab. The data has been of utmost need for community advocates who have coalesced to improve the state of Pacific Islanders in our current health crisis. However, the extent to which NHPI data can be democratized is limited by the data reporting practices of public health entities, particularly by those that don't disaggregate NHPIs. The most commonly available COVID-19 data by race and ethnicity are raw numbers of cases and deaths. This information is collected and memorialized into a database and afterwards, race and ethnicity specific rates are calculated on a weekly basis. These COVID case and death rates are determined using the American Community Survey 2018 one-year estimates with keen attention to population denominators that match the ways public health report demographic data. For instance, whether racial and ethnic groups are mutually exclusive or not. These rates are populated into data tables like the one for Los Angeles County shown below and are then translated into visuals like the graph seen here, making COVID-19 trends and impacts by race and ethnicity much more visible. Over time, these data tables and visualizations have been formally developed and compiled into comprehensive national level COVID-19 data summary reports that highlight the impact on NHPIs, of course, where the data is available. Within the report are NHPI cases and deaths, case and death rates, in addition to rankings of these rates compared to rates of other racial and ethnic groups. There are also useful map visualizations, one of which identifies where the most impacted NHPI populations are located by state. These reports are also disseminated weekly, regularly obtained by the National Pacific Islander COVID-19 response team, where the data is further dispersed to community-based organizations and smaller regional task forces and response teams. County level data reports similar to this are also created, usually upon request. These lab reports in the previous slide, as well as presentations that feature the lab's data have been used and applied in several notable settings with the purpose of advocating for NHPIs. These include the US House of Representative Ways and Means Committee, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus meeting with Dr. Anthony Fauci, in town halls, community engagement programs, and weekly meetings of the various Pacific Island COVID response teams, as well as nonprofit organizations. Not featured here, but this data was also extremely instrumental in the local efforts of the Inland Empire Pacific Islander response team that I currently lead alongside other community leaders. It has helped garner immense support from the region's public health departments and policymakers, providing us with the rare opportunity to launch federally funded community led public health interventions that target Pacific Islanders, which make the data directly attributable to on the ground change. Data, as we can see, are crucial building blocks for advocacy efforts, and these advocacy efforts are fueled by facts that make policy and systemic changes more attainable. Data is also essential in creating health education programs and resources which can improve population health and health outcomes, such as the recent LA County collaborative effort with the community to create the NHPI COVID-19 community toolkit that features Pacifica in-language messaging. And lastly, as the lab strives to democratize Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander data with the exciting launch of our dashboard today, we hope that gaps in health policy and gaps in access to healthcare are increasingly identifiable to ultimately make health equity more feasible and foreseeable in the near future. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague John Greer, who will speak on the automation processes in the lab that have truly made the difference in our work. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. So as mentioned in this section, uh, I'll be discussing the organization and evolution of our underlying work structure, uh, which consists of three general components. 
The first is the data collection, which is the process of scraping and extracting data from online resources. Second is data cleaning, uh, which consists of configuring the data into a usable form, merging different data sources together, and then creating valuable metrics. And the last is data reporting, uh, which takes this clean data and creates tools like our data summary reports and uh, dashboards that can inform stakeholders and the general public. So since our group's inception, we've undergone a pretty significant evolution in the way that we process disaggregated COVID-19 data. We want to speak about the effort involved in keeping this data pipeline flowing and how we're expanding our efforts and capacity to meet the growing need. I'm going to start by just giving an overview of our initial work structure, uh, which is a very manual process. And then Nick Pearson is going to follow with an explanation of how the structure has evolved into one that's more automated and sustainable long term. So when the group first formed, the data collection component encompassed most of our uh, work time. This data collection has been conducted primarily, as Carla said, on a weekly basis, both due to the high manual labor cost and the fact that states and counties are, nece are not necessarily updating their data every day, especially for NHPIs. So at the beginning, in consultation with NHPI community leaders and stakeholders, our group searched for states and counties with significant NHPI populations from which we could collect disaggregated data if such data was publicly presented or recorded. And as we see in many cases, uh, it is not. So this means that a group had to find where the data is being stored for each area of interest. Because the data can be presented in many different forms, it's a difficult process to standardize. So while most agencies to present their prefer to present their data visually via a dashboard. Others might opt for PDFs or CSVs or even APIs for direct data downloads. And while most uh, post raw totals, uh, some use other metrics like case rates or percentages. So there's a lot to consider in this process. Uh, once we consolidate a list of these online resources where the data was being presented, our group would visit these individual sites manually, taking screenshots or downloading data to retain a permanent record and then manually entering the data into a database that contains the historical data up to that point. Because most uh, sites do not make the underlying data on their dashboards available, this process requires a lot of tedious manual work. And to minimize the potential human error in this process, we needed to double up and designate fact checkers to review weekly entries for accuracy, because maintaining the data quality is obviously extremely imperative. While this data collection process started just with a small cohort of states, over the course of several months, this group has ballooned to dozens of states and counties, which makes this an even more time intensive process, especially in the beginning, uh, that must nonetheless be done every week. And that's because most data sources don't include the historical record. They only show the most recent, most recent data, that's usually the case. So if we miss a week, a week of data collection, we might not be able to recover that week's data because it's been supplanted by the newest week's version of the dashboard and they're usually cumulative totals. So it's with these difficulties in mind that one of our group's primary objectives when Nick and I joined in the summer was to eliminate as much friction in this data collection and cleaning process as possible by automating the web scraping component. And with that, I will pass it on to Nick Pearson. Uh, thank you very much, John. Now, our main goal in transitioning to automated data collection was to free up the lab's resources and time beyond gathering data toward analyzing our findings, engaging in further community outreach, and visually organizing NHPI data in a publicly available forum. The COVID tracking project, which is organized by the Atlantic and several partners and updated bi-weekly, proved to be one of our most valuable resources in this effort. After our lab members confirmed over a multi-week period that the COVID tracking project's data accurately reflected the latest state numbers, we switched from checking each individual state to scraping all states at once using the COVID tracking project's publicly available underlying files, which we could then curate into digestible forms focusing on native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in our geographic areas of interest. We then turned to the county level, which proved more challenging due to the wide range of approaches used by different county websites. This led us to a hybrid approach using Python scripts whenever possible. In some cases, we were able to automate the entire process to gather all relevant data. In others, we could only automate the screenshot process requiring manual entry of the numbers from the resulting files. And the least accessible websites still require manual weekly checks. This mixture of manual and automated data entry helped address potential errors both on our end and on the county dashboards end. Automated screenshotting and data entry reduces the risk of entering wrong numbers manually, 
while manual checks draw attention to changes in the organization of county websites or outright errors in their reporting. Increasing automation and the ongoing process of maintaining our scripts has ironically given us a greater appreciation for the human element of the lab. A tremendous amount of COVID data is publicly available online, but it is only useful so far as it can be interpreted. Once we completed the transition from manual checking to a hybrid human computer approach only recently within the past couple of weeks, uh, the lab could expand its focus from pure data entry to analysis, outreach, and visualizations. Exploring the data and using it to bring attention to the areas of greatest need remains an ongoing challenge for our lab. And with that in mind, I'd like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Calvin, to discuss our newly formulated data dashboard. Calvin. Thank you, Nick. At the lab, we believe that nonprofits, policymakers, and government agencies should base their decisions on data that accurately reflects the communities that they serve. But it should also reflect data that identifies where that accuracy is not present. And to that end, we created this dashboard that hopefully does both. As you can see from this map, you're looking at states that are shaded brown because those are the states that are currently disaggregating Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander COVID-19 cases and the states that are not are shaded gray. When your cursor hovers over states that are currently disaggregating our data, you'll see a small window appear that shows some key statistics for that state, but also a small line graph that allows the user to see what direction case rates for that state are headed in. And when your cursor hovers over a state that is currently not disaggregating our data, there's a small box that appears with text that shows exactly why it is that our data is being hidden, whether it's because our data is currently being hidden within the Asian American category or the other category, or if a state actually fails to even mention how it is that our data is currently being hidden. The second page of our dashboard features much the same uh, features as well, but for death rates. And as you can see, there are actually fewer states that report Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander COVID-19 deaths than they do cases. And one of the unexpected findings uh, for, our, for us was that Hawaii is one of the states that disaggregates our COVID-19 cases, but not our deaths. The final page of our dashboard was something that was designed with our community partners in mind. In the top left corner, users can click on the drop-down menu to select states that are currently disaggregating either NHPI COVID-19 cases or deaths. And once that data is selected, the line graphs will adjust to show that state's case rates or death rates. And this is an actual screenshot showing a data poll from earlier this week showing Arkansas's data. And as you can see, unfortunately, the rates are extremely high compared to those of other racial and ethnic groups. When the cursor hovers over each line in the line graph, you can see what the case or death rate was for that particular date for that state. And on the left side, you can see bar charts that demonstrate where it is that the state stands in relation to other states for their case rates or their death rates. Hopefully in the future, We'd like to enable new features based on whatever dis disaggregated Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander data is made available. And we hope that would include hospitalization, testing, and recovery rates. But more than that, we hope to also include greater geographic granularity, uh, such as county level or city level data. And last but not least, we hope to introduce new metrics that incorporate items such as a severity score based on work that Dr. Escobedo has already started. Something that we hope will provide users with the ability to see what the predicted rate is of communities being impacted and whether they will be severely impacted by COVID-19 in their respective areas. Before we move on to questions, I'd just like to give a heartfelt thanks to UCLA's Center for Health Policy Research staff for assisting us with making this seminar possible. And now I'd like to open it for questions. Thanks so much, uh, Calvin. So I'm going to moderate, I'll turn off my video. Um, there, there's been a lot of chat, chats and questions. So uh, I'll, um, I'll be 
the, uh, uh, the steward of this. So hang on. Um, so one of the questions um, was for the states that disaggregate Native Hawaiian data, are they mandated by their legislature? Would you be able to share the policies and laws that have mandated this disaggregated collection? Uh, so I'm going to um, give that to Calvin to answer. Uh, yes, so since 1997, the federal government has mandated that all federal agencies should be applying Office of Management and Budget Directive number 15, which disaggregates, which actually mandates the disaggregated category of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders for federal agencies. Um, at the state level, it depends on the state. For California, Government Code 8310.5, that actually mandates that agencies within California should be using disaggregated categories even beyond the Pacific Islander label to include Southeast Asians and various Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander categories. Unfortunately, enforcement is a mixed bag. And that's something that we hope that agencies and our community advocates will be able to help address. Great, thank you. And again, I remind folks to check out the Health Affairs blog uh, that Calvin, Karina, and Carla wrote that talks a little bit about the OMB 15 uh, federal standards of race ethnicity reporting. It's a mandate to disaggregate Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders from Asians. So um, I think this is a, would be a, a question for Karina. Um, Polynesia includes Aotearoa as well. Why are they not included in, the, um, in your slides, the count? Um, based on what I know, um, a lot of the data that is collected is, is from folks who do fill out the census and based on those who are able to do so. And I'll go ahead and um, lean on Calvin to add more to that. Uh, so our current data set is based on what's being reported by states within the United States of America. And we would love to, in the future, include territories such as Guam and American Samoa. Um, but if it would be helpful to also see how our communities across the world are also faring. Um, unfortunately, it's just not data that we've uh, been able to access at this time. Great. Um, there's some of you uh, audience, 300 strong, putting some questions in chat. So I'll try to go back and forth, but um, please try to put it in, in the Q&A. Um, there's an icon at the bottom of your Zoom where you can put the Q&A there. Uh, also, there was a request by Richard Leong to put the link to the health affairs blog post. And I wonder if Tiffany Lopes, our director of communications can put that there. Uh, so um, a question on uh, your network of data influencers is impressive. I didn't really think we were data influencers, but thank you. Uh, two questions. First, what is your strategy to support the movement from data awareness to action within these influencer groups? Uh, and second, how are you working with uh, Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities to engage them in results and in advocacy? Uh, these are hard questions. Um, so I'm gonna give it to Carla, because she's really great at hard questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ponce. So the way uh, data is, uh, you know, it's definitely used by the community. And I mentioned earlier that we have been directly working um, with Pacific Islander COVID response teams at both the national, state, and county levels. And so um, these um, coalitions are full of leaders from various nonprofit organizations and community-based organizations um, who have access to networks of Pacific Islanders. That way we are able to get the data um, in a presentable and understandable way to the community. Um, I hope that answers your question. So yes, we are working hard and it's with these coalitions that um, you know, have been very key to the inception of this group. So, so I think um, Carla is um, very humble and uh, that uh, these students, particularly 
um, the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students are not just scraping and, and um, generating data, uh, and, but, but also interpreting the data and going to community organizations to explain the data and, um, and uh, you know, re represent like, what's, what's going on uh, with, the, with the trends of COVID-19 for these communities. So it's like they're working you know, double, triple time. Uh, I Can think I you are the influencers. Go ahead, um, Karina. Sorry. Go ahead. Sure. Um, just to add on to what Carla Thomas is talking about, our work is really driven by the community that we're serving, right? So this means ensuring that community elders, leaders, the youth are all a part of this conversation. Um, Carla mentioned one great example that we've been working very closely with the National Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander COVID-19 response team, which really convened to address how these impacts are affecting our communities. And so every week when we're meeting weekly, we're working together to collect and scrape the data and also generate these reports that are then sent to the community constituents um, who are able to utilize this in their presentations um, and also use them in proposals to hopefully look for um, more resources that can be allocated to address some of these other issues that we're seeing. Um, one other thing just to be mindful of is that when we are working with the community, we really want to be intentional about the work that we're doing, right? So just making sure everyone's included in the conversation um, and also making sure that what we're presenting is in plain language. It's easy for folks to understand because a lot of these numbers can be really intimidating for folks who are experiencing some of this on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, and I think the other piece is the policy piece, right? And you've, um, you've shown the, um, the various testimonies that have been done. And they're one of our um, audience participants, Dr. Vicki Mays, thank you for being here, has posted um, an opportunity to submit some testimony. Uh, uh, Vicki, I believe you're, you're chairing this NCBHS, National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics that looks at data. So it's posted in chat and we can certainly um, submit uh, some uh, important points and arguments on data disaggregation, particularly for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And I think Vicki's also put some, uh, uh, a comment that some of the islands and territories do not have the infrastructure that is needed to do the work that is so essential. Uh, it, um, and ask, is it possible for us, the lab, to work with the Asian Caucus to advocate for legislation that will set up to fund this, these infrastructure and that she'd be happy to work with the Black Caucus who she's been working with to help with the collaboration? Um, I think we, we would, and we, we certainly um, invited the Congressional Asian Pacific uh, Caucus to be in. Uh, to join us in this conversation today. Karina, you were, were going to say something. Your box lit up. <laughs> um, there's a question about, um, actually, it looks like it was asked um, by multiple people on the, the notion of the risks of um, living in high density neighborhoods and multi-generational households. Um, and can you kind of explain more of that? And, and are there any other contributing factors um, that um, affect the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community? Um, I see Carla is nodding her head. Um, do you want to start with that, Carla? And then. Sure, I definitely want to add that there are many contributing factors as to why we're seeing this really a detrimental impact in the NHPI community. For instance, one out of four NHPIs are in the essential workforce, which can increase community spread infection. Um, NHPIs are also one of the fastest growing migrant populations in the US. So there's a large undocumented population, which creates barriers in access to healthcare. And there's also, of course, the cultural context of NHPIs, who are a very communal um, uh, population. And so there are many traditional events that are uh, prioritized in NHPI's ways of life. And these events are still carrying on during the pandemic, despite um, social distancing guidelines. And so um, I think that part of the question is also what are some solutions maybe, and it's 
difficult to narrow down, but I think that um, it definitely requires a holistic approach. So, uh, you know, we need to ensure the community with healthcare. We need to work in public information sectors to create messaging that resonates and adequately reaches the community. And we also need to support existing NHPI community efforts who are already working to um, improve health outcomes for NHPIs. Um, and I definitely um, like to uh, uh, say if my other colleagues would like to add on to that, um, but those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Calvin and Karina. I thought Carla covered it extremely well. The history of colonialization has unfortunately left our community in a place where the socioeconomic indicators find our communities in a very similar place to other communities of color. And we've already seen some research that has tied uh, low income to COVID-19 outcomes. And unfortunately, our community, in addition to the education data that Vanan uh, has provided for us, uh, we share many of the similar characteristics in terms of low income rates, um, home ownership versus renters, and unfortunately, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders suffer from disproportionate rates of diabetes and obesity. So I believe that there are numerous unfortunate contributing factors as a result of colonialization that has led to our community being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Great, thank you. Um, there's a, a question um, about, uh, do you have any methods for the protection of small number data? Uh, and is that an issue, this protection of small numbers? Um, I can, let me, let me take a stab at that. So, you know, the Center for Health Policy Research, um, we collect data from the California Health Interview Survey. Um, uh, and there's always, you know, we go through data disclosure review uh, because to protect uh, to protect a respondent, particularly if it's sensitive, for example, asking about green card status uh, so, and uh, about citizenship status. So their, their disclosure review is very important. Our, our feeling in tracking the data, um, the COVID data, however, is these are numbers of cases and numbers of deaths. And suppression rules that are in operation um, vary because they're arbitrary. Uh, and so there could be fewer than 11, for example, or fewer than 10. And the problem with that is that um, for a group that is small, then we, and, and you, know, you don't, you don't um, it may be too late. So waiting until the 11th death could be too late for communities. And so it's a different set of rules, particularly under COVID. Um, and, I have to say that the uh, NHPI community has worked, for example, with Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. I think some of you are here in the audience in meeting with the community and talking about why the need, why there's need to not suppress. And so in this case, suppression is not necessarily protection. Suppression could actually lead to missed opportunities to try to prevent the next COVID-19 death. So that's, um, so our methods actually is we try, you know, we scrape the data. Unfortunately, there, it varies across different local public health departments and states in terms of data suppression, which is why you saw that map of all the states that were not collect and we're not reporting any data on NHPIs. So, um, so based on that, somebody asked, when it comes to collecting data at the state level, who, who, what organizations can be held accountable for the emission of data for racial groups or the aggregation of data? Um, I think the, a lot of that is decision makers um, in producing um, this data. So um, who's accountable uh, would be the, the state leaders that are producing this data. Um, how, let's see. There's a, there's a lot of questions. Uh, oh, and there's one. Uh, I heard that you're using American Community Survey estimates for population denominators. Could you say a little more about whether you're using single race 
for multi-race estimates, um, are you using estimates for Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander alone or in combination? Anyone here can answer that question <laughs> since we've gone through so many meetings on what to use as denominators. So I'm going to go to Calvin. Sure. So when we initially started collecting data and we had to decide how to go about calculating the rates, um, there was an intense discussion as to whether or not to use NHPI alone or in combination versus the alone number. And we recognize that the alone or in combination number may more accurately reflect uh, the Native Hawaiian community because uh, they're one of the largest groups of multiracial um, people in the United States. Uh, we, uh, uh, we did, however, choose to go with the single race, I believe, because that was data that was uh, more recently available to us. And we wanted to make sure that we were consistent across the board in terms of what population estimates ACS was able to provide, especially for 2018's uh, one-year survey. Um, so that was something that uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about. And it may be possible in the future that future metrics will use the alone or in combination figure. Great, thank you. Um, this, uh, fabulous work, team. Uh, I, who could I contact to understand how data is scraped from the different states? Um, the Department of Health, I'm interested to understand disaggregated groups also in Asian subgroups. So I'm going to give that question to Nick. Uh, sure, thank you, Dr. Ponce. In terms of the data scraping on our end, uh, we're using two very different sources. The one at the state level is just going purely off of the COVID uh, data tracker project, which is run by the Atlantic. Uh, and their website is publicly available. I will post the link for that in the chat in, in just a moment. Uh, then at the county level, it's, it's extremely, it's a very diverse range. I think partially because there wasn't a lot of um, sort of guidance or, or leadership from the top down when the COVID pandemic began. And as a result, almost every single county across the whole country has their own approach um, to data gathering. And so we've, we've come across some sites that have beautifully disaggregated data that's extremely granular and detailed where we can get from you know, age, racial, ethnic group. And we found other ones that are, are very sparse, uh, very bare bones and have very little information. Uh, so in terms of scraping on our end, that's what, what we're doing. We're going to the COVID uh, tracking project website, downloading their underlying files, and then uh, going to a wide variety of individual websites. In terms of how the individual states gather their data, uh, that's sort of a broader question that is, that is it's an open question for us and one to pursue with a lot of these states that are not disaggregating data. Uh, I think as a lot of the, my fellow panelists and as Dr. Ponce have mentioned, um, one of the big frustrations and hurdles here is that 70% of states still don't make this data available. Um, and that's kind of a case-by-case -case basis where it's, it's an ongoing, ongoing mission to try to get these states to do so. Uh, Dr. Ponce, if you want to add anything to that? No, no, only that, again, um, we think, we call them the automators team. So the team that Calvin brought on, um, his classmates from the University of Chicago uh, program on computational analysis and public policy, uh, Nick and John, to help us with, you know, with uh, getting away from the laborious data scrapes. So thank you uh, for that. Um, yeah, in terms of, and there's also a, a, a there, we can, we can share what other data sets we've been looking at. NCHS has some data, but um, on deaths, uh, uh, American Public Media has data. So we've actually looked at a lot of different data sets, of course, the Hopkins data, but race, ethnicity specific cases and deaths are hard to come by. Uh, so the COVID race tracker is great for cases and deaths, but at the county level, um, it has to be uh, still um, you have to go to the local health departments. So I want to I think we have time for a few more questions um, until um, the closing blessing. But there is a question on limited English proficiency. How do you think limited English proficiency in the NH 
PI communities may affect their access to healthcare and this likelihood of being tested and counted in this reported statistics. And um, I will give that to Carla first, uh, but, but also to Vanan because uh, I know she's done some work on limited English proficiency in Southeast Asian community. So Carla, you're on mute, yeah, great. Thank you, Dr. Ponce. Um, so yes, there is definitely a problem um, with language barriers. And um, one of the ways um, I think that at the community level we're able to address this is with the response teams, they've had um, things like talk story events where they invite the community and um, in the past, they have been in language. So one in the past was in Samoan and I was able to give a data presentation in Samoan um, for uh, the majority faith-based community. And that's really, um, it, you know, it's very important to create data that is meaningful, that is, um, you know, comprehensible to uh, the community in, in, uh, by addressing that language barrier. Um, I also think it's important that our local public health departments also, um, you know, um, extend their in-house translators um, to feature more, um, you know, NHPI languages. Um, the priority right now is mostly, um, you know, Spanish in Spanish or um, other Asian languages, but very little do we ever see, you know, NHPI um, COVID-19 messaging. Right. Thank you. And Van Anne, would you like to add on to that? Yeah. Um, so I agree with everything that Carla has said. Um, and one of the things that I also was able to look at based on the data from this past summer was um, the we collected some county data within California for a specific county. And we were able to determine the case to death ratios within um, Asian population. Well, not case to death ratios within Asian populations, but um, we then correlated that with um, Correlate that with the percentage of East Asians and South Asians and Southeast Asians by county using ACS five-year data. And we saw that there was a greater cases to death ratio for Asians in comparison to white with increasing percentages of Southeast Asians um, within the category counties that we looked at. Um, it should be noted that, you know, we didn't take it into account age. We can't really say that one subgroup is bearing a greater burden than the other based on the correlation, but it does suggest that there might be differing burdens. And going back to that, that could be a result of um, limited English proficiency, just like Carla had mentioned. Um, and it would suggest that, you know, again, just going back to being that by aggregating API data, we might be uh, math inequity um, or a higher burden of COVID-19 amongst the specific, um, Asian population. Thank you. Uh, I, I want John to say something. So John, how hard was it to stand up the, the dashboard? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, uh, for me, it was a, a challenge. Um, the automation was too. Uh, the dashboard was primarily uh, compiled by uh, Calvin and I with a lot of supporting data work done by Nick. Uh, in case anyone is curious, the tool that we used for this dashboard was Tableau. Um, and, you know, we had to think very careful, carefully about how to best present the data in a way that showed uh, the trajectory really effectively that made the comparison uh, particularly distinct. Uh, and if you go to the dashboard and look at a state uh, like, say, Arkansas, and you look at the line graphs there, I think it paints a really uh, incredible picture, <laughs> not exactly in a good way. Uh, but there's a lot of a lot of work that went into producing the dashboard in this past month, and our goal is that uh, this just be the foundation. As Calvin mentioned, there are a lot of metrics that we'd like to include, uh, and there are a lot more, uh, you know, different charts that I think could that could tell the story really effectively that we that we'd like to add as well. So it's, it's just a matter of time. Again, with the automation, you know, we've been able to expand our capacity for what we're able to do on the analysis side. Um, so, so I think this is just the beginning for that. Great, thank you. Um, and there were um, a number of questions and concerns about um, what happens when you, you know, unveil these statistics, might there be some negative backlash, you know, of blaming um, and uh, uh, stigma uh, for the NHPI community. 
And I think, so what are ways that you could recommend contextualizing um, these disparities when reporting them? So I'm gonna take, a, again, just first stab at that because guess we need to close soon. Um, I think the, the emphasis on that 25% of essential workers is really you know, important that this community is out there and working and keeping this economy going. I um, think that that's really important. Uh, in, in Arkansas, like you hear about the stories about, about meatpacking places, about, you know, we want to ensure that we still get things delivered and that we get our food. And so that communities of color and the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander story doesn't get told as much, are also participating quite high in, um, in essential work. So I think that that's one story that we hope to contextualize that. And then the other story is the one of resources that a lot of the disparities that we're seeing now it are, you know, are, have been around and are just amplified during this, this pandemic. And so I think the story then is then to help the policymakers to, look, to give more attention to this group and address a lot of the structural determinants that have occurred and then long historical structural racism that has occurred uh, has been has affected this community. So, um, so I think that that's something that we'd love to work with some of you here um, that are interested and to, um, I mean, the lab is not just for data, the data is, is for action and for resources uh, to mobilize communities. So I thank you so much. That's all the time we have for questions. Um, as we conclude today's presentation, I'd like to reintroduce Pastor P.K. Thompson, who will lead our closing blessing today. And um, thank you and have a wonderful day. Hi folks, thanks again for um, having me close off, begin and uh, close off this uh, very, very um, uh, uh, amazing and wonderful discussion. I wanted to just leave you off with this. Um, you know, in the Pacific Islands, uh, specifically in the islands of Samoa, we have a saying, and that means where there's a coconut tree, you don't plant coconut trees in the islands, you just plant one, and the rest of them just kind of grow from there. And the spiritual message today is that I would hope that this discussion leads to something uh, greater, uh, more of an unveiling and a revealing in the process, and as I said, and many have attested to today, you know, Pacific people are a minority with a majority mindset. And I think in moving forward, um, there is sort of um, a need that we have all uncovered today. And I want to make sure that I leave you with this, that this work is spiritual in its nature. Um, everyone that has gathered here from the NHPI community sees this work as a spiritual venture into something greater because we all hold ourselves as people who collectively think, eat, live, and breathe together uh, in the Pacific Islands as responsible to each other. And I would hope that the professionals and the healthcare professionals and those who are the educators and professors who are gathered here uh, will take a little bit of that from the NHPI community. Let us, let us end in a blessing. God, thank you for the people who have gathered, the voices that we have heard, we are in amazement at the talents of those who have gathered and the work that they have compiled and the information and data that they have shared with us. We just hope that that data and those, those stories and these slides uh, have faces and that the voices um, that sort of come through these slides and the individuals that represent their own uh, specific Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities here in the States um, that those who have uh, gathered here um, can do something in more unveiling and more revelation and more uh, bringing out of information uh, will come in the future. Bless those who have gathered. Bless those whom this information uh, will help in their work ahead as far as equity and sustaining NHPI communities. And for that, also all of our communities, as we know in the and will be um, unchristian and unfaithful of us to not know, uh, mention in our blessing and in our prayers of closing today that we remember this nation, we remember the Black lives, 
that have been lost and remember that we need healing in this moment. But first, we must hear and listen to those uh, who are suffering and who are in pain. All of these things I bring before you in the name of all who have gathered and those we hold most precious and most high. And I pray specifically in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Um, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you for joining us. Um, as uh, Tiffany Lopes has put uh, in the chat, um, please email us some further questions. And we as a team will try our best to um, address any needs that you may have or uh, any further conversation. Thank you so much. Wow.